It's Monday, and that so happens to be the day that I like to talk about monsters. I'm Jeff Arbuckle. This is Monster Mondays, presented to you by Film Seizure. And boy, do I have a treat for this week. Uh, this is uh, probably the most decorated movie that has been covered so far on uh, Monster Mondays. It is Guillermo del Toro's 2017 Oscar winner for not just for Best Director for him, but for Best Picture, The Shape of Water. Um, this movie is... Real, I really like this movie quite a bit, um, and and I hope that that uh, comes across as I talk about it here. But uh, this received 13 Oscar nominations in total, which is uh, one of the highest uh, totals that any one movie has ever received for Oscar nominations. But um, it's uh, it was only the second fantasy film to ever win best picture because that's really what this movie is it's uh it's a little bit of a romance it's a little bit of an adventure at parts um it's mostly a fantasy it's told in a fairy tale kind of way um and it's it's just it's generally speaking um kind of an old-fashioned movie and i'll talk all about that here in just a moment uh, as i kind of continue to talk about this uh, movie in general, but, uh, like Del Toro's, uh, Pan's Labyrinth before it, uh, it, this landed on a considerable number of top 10 lists and best of, uh, list for that year. Um, it, it's, it's really one of the things that I like so much about Del Toro is being a, uh, a monster fan myself and he almost in almost every movie he's ever done uh monsters are not really truly the monsters it was it's usually somebody who is without uh empathy or without sympathy or without um uh, uh compassion for other living beings those people and they almost entirely are people uh, are the true monsters whereas he really kind of romanticizes creatures um you know some of them are bad some of them are good but they're like people in that way um and just because something is weird the 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 moral of the story that that del toro is trying to tell in a lot of his movies is that you shouldn't you shouldn't fear something that is different um and that's really at the crux of the shape of water which honestly <laughs> um it, it's probably his magnum opus of, of talking about differences and why differences shouldn't be feared you should be um you should still have compassion and empathy and embrace things that are different than you um but right out of the gate this movie uh, kind of hits upon the two things I've already just talked about. Uh, the fact that this is a fairy tale and that uh, it, it's about monsters, but not the monster you think it's about. Um, the movie starts off with, uh, with some opening dialogue from Richard Jenkins, who plays uh, Giles, who is Eliza's neighbor. And Eliza is the main character in this, played by Sally Hawkins. But he talks about this as uh, he as being a fairy tale. It's not really told from a particular time, so it's not like one of those a long time ago in a distant land and all like how we typically hear uh, fairy tales told. It's not about a place. It's it's about the people that are in this story and the. Uh, struggle that those people have uh, when it comes to what's about to happen in this movie. Um, and it's really kind of interesting because right from the get-go, Guillermo del Toro wanted to tell this in a fantasy kind of way. He was heavily inspired by the uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon. One look at the amphibian man in this movie and you and you're going to see the creature from the black lagoon it's um and it's it's doug jones playing that uh the amphibian man in this because del toro goes to jones a lot uh he played uh an amphibious creature 
in the Hellboy movies. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, he's, he's a great, uh, stunt man in that sense like a, like he's he's very very like he and Andy Serkis who was in the Lord of the Rings movies um they are the best at emulating um creatures and things that are not human but um he really wanted to tell a, a story from the perspective of the creature uh, because if you've ever seen Creature from the Black Lagoon, and it is something I've talked about on this show before, uh, that creature is hunted. Um, it is something that is meant to be defeated. People come into its home, and he's the creature's kind of reacting to that, and now suddenly the creature's the bad guy. It's that classic tale of... Uh, and it's been done in other movies before, where the invaders are uh, thinly disguised as the heroes when in fact they're kind of the villains uh, and that's always been something that's that's always resonated with me with uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon obviously it does the same for Del Toro but he wanted to tell the story from the perspective of the uh, of the creature and instead of him being defeated at the end he wins the girl now of course the studios are like no thank you to that because there's implications there right um, you don't want uh, you don't want to see a human girl <laughs> uh, being romanced by a creature. But it, it didn't really deter him. He kept, uh, you know, trying to get this movie made. He finally got it made after about six years of, of trying. And really what he did was kind of weave this tale that is not set in the present day. It's set in 1962, but even though it's set in the past, it could it is kind of timeless. Um, because of some of the themes that go on in this movie, but um, he's he's telling a story from a troubled time that wasn't the present, um, and kind of really showing how it's uh, a struggle for a lot of the characters that are in this movie. So first, you have Sally Hawkins who plays Eliza Esposito. She is a uh, mute who is an orphan. She was found uh, next to a river. She has scars on her neck, which is uh, what a lot of people assume is why she can't speak. She communicates uh, pretty much the entire movie by way of sign language. However, uh, there is one particular point where she actually does speak, but um, uh, Sally Hawkins was nominated for Best Actress for this movie. But uh, she is a third shift uh, janitor, basically, at a government lab in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, you see that she has a pretty lonely life. Uh, basically, she is stuck in a rut. She's doing, uh, her life is basically a routine. It's, there's not really much magic to it. Um, she gets up uh, in the evening every day. She goes and uh, boils eggs to take in her lunch when she goes to work. She takes a bath while the egg, uh, uh, there's an egg timer that's uh, timing how long she's cooking her eggs. She takes a bath. She masturbates every day. I'm, you know, they show this in great detail. And she goes off to work. She, on her way to the bus stop, she stops and uh, admires a pair of red high heels that she wants to someday buy, but she has no reason to buy them. Um, and when she gets on the bus, she, uh, puts her scarf in her hat and she uses her hat as a, uh, <laughs> as a pillow to sleep on the way to work. That's her routine every single day. And we see it, uh, play out like that quite often. Uh, her neighbor is Richard Jenkins. Uh, he is Giles and Giles is an advertising illustrator. He's a recovering alcoholic. Uh, and he's a closeted gay man. Uh, in 1962, it's not an easy time for him. Um, for Eliza, of course, it's not easy uh, with a uh, disability. And she can't speak. So, um, you know, it's not exactly an easy time for her either. Um, at work, she has a, a friend and co-worker that she's known for about a decade named Zelda, and that's Octavia Spencer. Um, and of course, she's a black woman in 1962, kind of working a pretty bottom of the, 
of the you know the bottom of the ladder job also doing janitorial stuff um and the main villain in this movie is played by michael shannon and michael shannon's fantastic in this he plays a guy by the name of richard strickland he's a colonel uh and he is kind of overseeing a project that is uh coming into this uh government laboratory facility which is of course the amphibian man um we also have um uh, Michael Stolbarg, who is playing a, a guy named Bob Hofstetler. Uh, he's uh, one of the scientists there, but he's actually a Soviet spy um, who basically the whole study around this creature, the amphibian man, is all related loosely to the U.S. space program um, because obviously this thing has gills, but it can also breathe, so it obviously is able to uh, exist in um, environments that you wouldn't think it would be built for. They're trying to figure out why that's the case, how he evolved that way so that people could use it in space. It's it's very tenuous, but it's kind of doesn't really matter. Um, Strickland, uh, the Michael Shannon character, is particularly cruel. Um, he tortures the creature... Uh, exactly why it's not really said like it doesn't really matter what his pain tolerance is I think it's just something that Strickland likes to do he carries around a cattle prod um, the, you know Eliza realizes that it's got blood on it at one point so you know she's already very uneasy with what's going on there um, he gets uh, a couple of his fingers bitten off <laughs> um, and she finds them in the cleanup there and uh, that's when the first time she sees the actual creature too the, the amphibian man um, and throughout the course of the movie there are um, arcs that almost all of these characters go through the Soviet spy does not want to bring harm to the amphibian man because he's a scientist first and foremost um eliza begins uh meeting with the uh or, you know going to see the creature as often as she possibly can um she uh makes friends with it by sharing one of her hard, hard boiled eggs with it uh with him i should say um then she plays music for him um then at one point while he's in um like a, a smaller tank or whatever and he's kind of watching her mop up the place she kind of dances for him um you know one day um she finds him out of the water and he's been tortured he's been hurt by strickland um and this is when you really find out that uh the real thrust of the movie is is that strickland wants to vivisect the creature and um the soviet spy argues against it but he ultimately loses which now brings eliza to the decision that she needs to free the amphibian man by any means necessary so she's able to um kind of rope in Giles who is also kind of on a downswing um, he's not able to get an advertising job that he thought he pretty much had in the bag um, a guy that he had uh, that he was attracted to uh, turns out is not gay uh, and it gets kind of ugly and then he also realizes once that veil is lifted how bad that person really is like he's particularly racist and so he's kind of down in the dumps he's not really sure that um that he's doing the right thing but he realizes that eliza is the only thing he has in the whole world so he kind of has to help her um so this is where you get uh kind of you have three factions kind of rushing towards the amphibian man you have strickland who is preparing to um basically kill the amphibian man and vivisect him and dissect him i guess uh then you have eliza and giles trying to free the creature but then you also have the russian spy who has been told himself to kill the creature but realizes that eliza has a connection with him he's he has seen her communicate with uh you know with the amphibian man and so decides to help her get uh the the creature out of there which then she basically keeps uh, keeps him in a tub at her apartment. Um, 
and it's at that point that uh, basically these various arcs kind of reach a, a, a critical stage. For example, uh, Strickland's mental health, now that he's lost the, the creature, uh, is deteriorating. His fingers, uh, the operation to sew the fingers that he lost back onto his body, isn't working. They're basically rotting and starting to smell, which is um, also kind of physically emblematic of his problems. Um, the, uh, the Russian guy is basically going to be executed. Um, Zelda it ultimately when, when Strickland finds out that Zelda helped um, Eliza get the creature out she is threatened in her home by Strickland um, but all the while while everybody's kind of starting to go on a downswing Eliza is finding more completeness to her life It's, it's a, a, the magic is in her life if you will um Yes, she does have sex with the uh, amphibian man. But in doing so, she starts to realize the things that she's missed out on in life. Um, that's a theme that, that comes up a lot. Because at one point, Giles um, asks the creature if he was always alone. And he says that sometimes he can't recognize his own face in the mirror. He just sees the eyes that he recognizes on an old face. And that he, he wonders if he was born too early or too late to be able to live the life that he needs to live. So, you know, you have these cycles of people um, either through necessity being stuck in a situation or through uh, a series of events are either deteriorating or uh, finding the things that they've always been missing in life. Every single character in this movie also, in some way, shape, or form, is missing something as well. The Russian scientist is missing the knowledge that he wants to get about the creature. Um, uh, Strickland, uh, Michael Shannon, is missing some of the vir uh, uh, virility in his life. He's incomplete because of the uh, because of getting his fingers bitten off. He is. Um, not very emotionally uh, present with his family or with his wife. Um, Giles can't live the life he wants to live because he's a gay man in 1962. That's not going to work out. And Eliza is an orphan who doesn't really understand her place in anything. But with the, with the amphibian man, she finds those things. Um, so what we end up... Uh, having to do is on the day that she is to be you know that she is to uh, release him into uh, a canal that will lead out to the sea uh, she uh, you know Strickland arrives and shoots the creature and shoots her uh, the one thing that we have seen throughout the course of the movie is that the amphibian man does have a, uh, a power to heal himself and others very quickly and then he's able to uh, heal himself, uh, rid themselves of Strickland, uh, and is able to ultimately heal uh, Eliza and revealing that the scars on her neck that seemingly was what caused her to be mute are actually just gills and that she is uh, very similar to the amphibian man and Richard Jenkins, Giles, closes out the movie by saying that uh, he likes to believe that uh, they have uh, that they ended up living happily ever after and remained in love forever uh, and the thing that, that that's what he ultimately wants to believe ended up happening whether or not that's really what happened it doesn't really matter it's what he chooses to believe to happen which makes uh, makes him happy uh, so this movie's really really good um, this was one of those movies that you don't really see made too often for, for a few reasons and that's where, that's where we're going to get into my three likes here first and foremost um, it's a very old fashioned type of movie and your first clue of that is um, really in the score now the score this was an Oscar winning uh, original score for Alexandra Desplat um, and he is a uh, the way he scores the scenes with Sally Hawkins 
or Richard Jenkins is very old timey. Um, it's very light. It's very uh, romantic. It's very uh, it's very wishful, and and it's um, it, it's it basically just kind of dances along, and that's very important because one of the things that that uh, Giles is always talking about, he's always talking about stars from the past, particularly musical and dancing uh, talent, and they uh, they communicate a lot by way of dancing uh, particularly Sally Hawkins character there's a whole scene in which she uh, is it's the night before she's going to take the amphibian man to the canal so that she can release him and she's singing to him but it's in her head because what she does is she uh, we get to see her fantasy of having kind of like this kind of old Hollywood black and white dance number with an amphibian man and it's so charming and it's so old fashioned that it is it, it it really does kind of play to that magic of movies you always hear that you know every oscar ceremony they always talk about oh the magic of movies and oh i remember how much magic i felt when i saw et or whatever it's the same sort of thing um in this it is uh it's quite literal um you know, Eliza and Giles live above a movie theater. And so you're always hearing movies playing in the background. And Giles is always watching musicals. And Sally is always hearing music in her head uh, and able to kind of dance to it. Um, there's an adorable little dance that Giles and um, Eliza do while sitting on a couch and eating uh eating lunch and and a lot of that comes from the score now the stuff that happens at the lab uh is scored differently it's scored more uh, it's more intense it's uh, it's meant to be more uh you're you're tensed up and you're scared because she's doing things she should not be doing and could very easily get very hurt <laughs> uh if she continues to do the things that she's doing with the amphibian man uh, just by going to see him and having lunch, you know, having taking her lunch breaks with him. The second thing that I like that really ties into all of that is that um, the movie is not a very pretty movie in the looks of it. It's very drab. Uh, it's very uh, like almost every building you see bricks, uh, you know, exposed bricks. The the laboratory that the that the amphibian man is kept in is just. Uh, it's very cold and it's not very cozy. It's constantly raining. Um, it it does not seem like a very happy world. Yet, the the story that it's telling is so juxtaposed to that that there's so much of these like little wonderful things that are happening throughout the course of the movie, where. Um, the people who reside in this very ugly world are actually pretty beautiful, except for Michael Shannon's character. He's a terrible person in this, but um, but it's it, it does play out like a fairy tale where you have uh, like the like the princess and the frog. But in this case, it's a little bit more like uh, you know a prince and a frog, where you know where the amphibian man has to basically make this person into something like he is uh which is um you know really kind of brings brings it full circle that this is entirely told like a fairy tale um so you know everything in this movie is so almost ugly to look at but the way that the story and the characters juxtapose to that is uh it makes it a beautiful movie and it's probably the reason why the production design also won an Oscar for this movie. Um, so, you know, it's it's that perfect juxt juxtaposition uh, of those things that, that really make this such a uh, an engrossing movie. Then, uh, thirdly, Sally Hawkins is amazing in this movie. She has to act almost entirely from her eyes and her mouth. Um, you know, she can give little... Uh, you know, little expressions with her eyes, um, small little smiles or larger smiles. 
um, she she doesn't speak in this movie, and you know everything that she's going through, even if you cannot read the uh, you know the the sign language that she's using. It's um, it, it, you know she did not win the the Academy Award for Best Actress, even though she was nominated. Uh, her, Richard Jenkins, and uh, Octavia Spencer were all nominated for acting awards in this. None of them won, but um, she was really deserving, I think. And um, it's one of those situations where, you know, she she's having to act with her entire body, which she does because, you know, she almost kind of uh, unflinchingly does full nude scenes in this movie. Um, she is, you really do believe that she is a real, she's not just playing a character, but that she's a real person. And it, she's very, um, it, it's very cute. Uh, and it's, and she's very likable and she's in, um, you can see her working things out as she's looking at things or as she's, um, you know, she can see her st studying things to try to figure out how she can get the, the amphibian man out of the lab. It's, it's just a great performance. Well, that wraps up this week's monster Mondays. If you didn't tell, I really like this movie. I could talk for hours about this movie. Uh, but, uh, don't forget to check out new episodes of film seizure every Friday or every Wednesday. I'm sorry. Uh, at filmseizure.com you can also check out uh, new installments of monster mondays each monday also on filmseizure.com these uh episodes the film seizure podcast and monster mondays you can find those where podcasts are found like soundcloud apple and google podcasts uh stitcher tune in spotify and through audible on Amazon. Additionally, you can hop on over to Facebook and Twitter and you can follow us by just searching for Film Seizure. And while you're at it, head over to www.bmovieenema.com. That's my website. You can read a new text article and review every Friday. Uh, if you want to watch a movie with me, you can go over to uh, YouTube and find the B-Movie Enema channel, and you can check out the episodic B-Movie Enema, the series. Uh, full movies. Uh, new episodes of that will be coming out every Saturday from January 2nd to March 27th, 2021. So uh, we're getting pretty close to the end of the first season here, but season two will be coming at the end of the year. So uh, come watch a full movie with me. Uh, just search for B-Movie Enema on YouTube, or you can go over to bmovieenema.com. You can watch it there as well. So until next week, everybody, stay spooky.